I remember uh, once uh, Bob Nozick gave, started a lecture and he said, uh, can people hear, hear me in the back? And someone said, we can't hear you in the front. And he said, <laughs> and he said well, go to the back where you can hear. Uh, uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is uh, theory and history. And naturally, the most important book to read on this topic is uh, the one by Mises called Theory and History, which came out in 1957. Uh, this is the fourth of Mises' four most important books. You know, you have the Theory of Money and Credit, which originally came out in 1912, then uh, Socialism, 1922, and these, those two are in the German edition, then Human Action, 1949, and Theory and History, 1957. And it's the least read of the four major works, although it's probably the easiest one to read. Now, one, uh, one reason I mention the four major works of Mises is this is sometimes a question that comes up in either the written or oral exam. So, that's one, be sure if you're planning to take that exam, uh, that's one you, you might take note of. Uh, now what I'm going to do today, we're talking about uh, the theory of history. When we talk about uh, philosophy of history, we can use the philosophy of history in, to mean two uh, different subject matters and that correspond to two different meanings of history. Uh, history can refer either to the events that happened in the past. So uh, we would have, say, history of the Civil War or history of the fall of the Roman Republic and so on. But <coughs> we, history could also refer to the process of writing about these past events. Sometimes this is called historiography. Uh, there was a, a book published by Harry Elmer Barnes uh, called History of Historical Writing, and it includes a section at the end called The History of the History of History. Uh, but so we have these two different meanings of uh, History, we would have history as the events, and then uh, history as the process of writing. So corresponding to that, there are two different meanings of philosophy of history. One would be, which is the main uh, one I'm going to be talking about in this lecture, is uh, the study of philosophical problems that arise in thinking about the historian's activity. So it would be, say, questions such as, uh, what are historians doing when they explain events? What's the nature of historical explanation? That would be the sort of question we'll be addressing here. Now there's another meaning of philosophy of history that corresponds to the first meaning I distinguished of history. And here, philosophy of history would refer to a view that history, meaning the events that have happened in the past, all of history falls into a certain pattern. So in addition to having histories of particular countries or particular topics, say history of technology or history of science, there is some notion and when we talk about philosophy of history of an, of an account of the whole of history. The claim would be that history, the whole historical process has meaning and among the people who wrote who were philosophers of history in this sense were Hegel, it was a, gave lectures on philosophy of history. We would have a, in the 20th century Oswald Spengler, Arnold Toynbee, Eric Vogelin, who was a student of Mises. Mises was very suspicious of philosophy of history. And if, depending on uh, how far we get in the lecture, 
will discuss some of the problems he found with this idea of a pattern for all of history. Uh, now, in considering uh, the, uh, the this main topic, which is uh, considering how, uh, the philosophical problems that arise in history, in writing history, one very important point is the historian can use praxeology, what we've been studying all, all week, to help explain historical events. Uh, for example, in which I think one of the best uh, cases applying praxeological insight to history is Murray Rothbard's book, America's Great Depression, which came out in, in 1963. And this, what Rothbard is doing here, is attempting to explain the onset of the 1929 Depression. And here he uses the, what he does in explaining the onset of depression, he, he, he's guided by Austrian business cycle theory. You'll recall from other lectures you, you heard, in Austrian business cycle theory, the key point is the, uh, there's an expansion of bank credit that drives the rate of interest on money, the loan rate of interest, below the rate determined by people's time preference. And as a result, there is malinvestment that and when this can't be sustained, then these uh, businesses that uh, were invested in because of expansion of bank credit will collapse, and then the depression is the process of readjusting the economy to the actual rate of time preference. So when Rothbard is studying the, uh, uh, the onset of the Great Depression, uh, what he's considering is the, the Federal Reserve policy in the 1920s, and he emphasizes that the uh, Federal Reserve, under the guidance of Benjamin Strong, who was the governor of the uh, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the most powerful person in the system at that time, was trying to expand credit in order to help the Bank of England. There was a very close friendship between Strong and the governor of the Bank of England, who was called Montague Norman. And Rothbard sees that as the key to understanding the onset of the Great Depression. Uh, now, uh, another example of applying uh, praxeological insight to a historical event uh, can be found in the brief account that uh, Mises gives of a decline of the Roman Empire in human action. I think in, if you have the uh, scholar's edition, the one published by Mises, I think it's around 762 that he discusses this. So what Mises says is that uh, because of the systems of price control in effect, uh, there was a, this disrupted the monetary system. There was a decline in trade and this led to a uh, centering of production more at the local level, more at the level of the latifundia, the estates. And so there was a disruption in the economy, and this disruption weakened the Roman Empire and made it susceptible to invasion. And here, uh, 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 Mises was relying on a famous work by Michael Rostovtsev on the social and economic history of the Roman Empire. Rostovtsev was uh, gone into exile in the United States because of the Bolshevik Revolution. He wrote a very influential book. So here Mises is using, again, a point from economic theory to help explain the uh, the 
uh, decline of the Roman Empire. So you see here how he's guided by his insight into economic theory. Uh, now another one, I didn't make a slide on this, we can have where Mises uses uh, economic insights to explain a historical event. When he, a few pages in human action, when he's considering the Industrial Revolution in England, uh, although he doesn't like the term Industrial Revolution, you'll find this, I think, in uh, human action around, in, again, that scholarly around 613 to 619. And what he says there, uh, he's considering the question some people say, well, the Industrial Revolution led to a decline in worker standard of living. And what he says is uh, he would, because of his knowledge of economics, uh, having an increase in the, uh, in the market would not lead, it, other things being equal, lead to a decline. But he says there was a tremendous increase in population at that time in England. And had it not been for the development of the market, then uh, people, a lot of people would have simply died altogether. They would have no means of support. So we see here, because of Mises' knowledge of economic theory, he's looking beyond the uh, poor conditions of the workers at, uh, say, in late 18th century England. He's asking, what would the alternatives have been had there not been an increase in the industrialization, what's le led him to ask that question is his knowledge of economic theory. Uh, I've said that the economist is guided by praxeological insight, and given the example of uh, Rothbard applying Austrian business cycle theory to explain the Great Depression, but uh, if a historian isn't an Austrian, say, and uses other theories, uh, that the historian will be guided by those theories. Uh, for example, if we look at a book that came out the same year, 1963, as America's Great Depression, this is a famous one, uh, a Monetary History of the United States by Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz. Uh, those authors are not Austrians. They have a completely different way of explaining the Depression and what they were uh, uh, followers of a, a quantity theory of money. So what's important for them is that when uh, in uh, the period around 1932, there was a big fall in the quantity of money. And they say uh, what, what the problem, what led to the stock market crash becoming a, a major depression was that the, the Federal Reserve System wasn't expanding the money supply enough. So you see, it's a very different uh, interpretation from Rothbard's, and you see in each case the uh, writers are guided by the historical theory they hold. Uh, what Rothbard says when he's talking about the uh, Federal Reserve policy in 1932, he says, well, the fall in money supply wasn't due to the Fed contracting the supply, it was just there was a fall, people were not spending as much, and he doesn't think the Fed should have reacted by trying to expand the money supply. So once again, you see how the theory can guide what the, the way the historian is presenting the facts and trying to understand them. Uh, now, I'll give another example here of uh, how uh, theory can influence how this story can explain a historical event. And this uh, concerns the 
interpretation of fascism, particularly the uh, Nazi economy. Now, the Marxist account, say, we find in the, say, in the book by uh, uh, Franz Neumann, who was a leading, he had been a member of the famous Frankfurt School, and then he became a professor at Columbia. Uh, he had a book called Behemoth, which was a study of the Nazi economy. And what he said was really, it was the monopoly capitalists who were uh, behind the Nazi system, that they were the ones really running things, that because in the Marxist view, capitalism was collapsing, it required an authoritarian uh, dictatorship to keep it in power to prevent a revolution, communist revolution or socialist revolution from overthrowing it. So that uh, the capitalists had decided to throw in their lot with Hitler, not that they could completely control him, but they recognized that he was really operating in their interests. Now, Mises uh, rejected this view completely, and what he emphasized is that in the Nazi system, although you had pr uh, private ownership, there were people who would say they were the owners, say, of the, uh, the steel factory or the various, all the other firms, the government was telling these people what prices they were supposed to charge, what wages they could pay. The ostensible owners had no discretion in what prices and wages to charge, so we didn't really have a capitalist system at all. It was just a form of socialism. It was a form of socialism in which the government is preserving the form of private property. They're still owners, but the ostensible owners don't have any power. They're not really in charge. So again, it's the theoretical insight that Mises had into this form of socialism that enabled him to explain uh, the Nazi system in a different way from the Marxist view. And I should say later uh, research has supported me as there was a very big book by Gerald Feldman who was a historian at, at Berkeley showing that the big business really didn't support Hitler in uh, when Hitler was coming to power. They, some of them gave contributions, but they tended to give contributions to a lot of the major parties and they weren't at all backing him as their as their preferred choice. Now, uh, it's not only economics that, uh, praxeology, that according to Mises, uh, helps the historian understand events. The historian is applying economics to understand events, but Mises says that a historian's account can't contradict the results of contemporary science. So if science has established something, then the historian's account has to, take, has to take note of that. And he gives an example which I find funny for a reason I'll explain, although uh, when I've given this in lectures in the past, unfortunately, very few people laugh, even though I find it funny. Uh, Mises says that if a historian is trying to explain the history of witchcraft, he wouldn't say that what happened was that certain women, certain witches had really made a pact with the devil because uh, we don't believe such things now. And the part that I find funny is uh, one leading 20th century historians of witchcraft was the English writer Montague Summers, and he took just the theory that Mises said a historian wouldn't take nowadays, that he really thought there were witches who had made a pact with the devil. Uh, he was a very uh, 
unusual person. He, he claimed to be, a, I think, a Catholic priest, but there was some doubt whether he really was one. Uh, one of my teachers, Walter Starkey, knew him and had, had stories about him. He, would always, he also claimed various people had plagiarized from him, such as the uh, Italian literary historian Mario Prats, but that's just a digression. But what Mises would say, I tend to, I'm, I'm quite old, I tend to have a lot of digressions. <laughs> but what uh, Mises, I think, of course, would reply to this is that that was, some, that was a fault in Summer's work, that the historian to do a good job should be in accord with contemporary science. Oh, although the historian is trying to apply uh, praxeology, use, use praxeology to try to help him explain particular events, there are limits to this. Uh, we can't deduce particular events from the laws of praxeology. Remember in the first lecture, which uh, uh, those of you here were unfortunate enough to have to listen to, uh, I mentioned that what we're doing in praxeology is explaining the form of an action, the structure that any action has to have in order to be an action. And we're not concerned in praxeology. We don't deduce particular events. Uh, as an example, I just mentioned uh, when Rothbard is, uses the Austrian business cycle theory to explain the onset of the Great Depression in 1929, uh, given various uh, historical events, he can try to show that the money supply expanded and give an explanation of that, but he couldn't deduce just from Austrian business cycle theory that there had been an expansion of the money supply. He would need to show by use of historical data that there had been such an expansion. So he can't deduce the particular historical events from uh, just from praxeology. Uh, so here, Mises is in part agreeing with the logical positivists. Remember, the positivists were his big enemies in methodology. They said, uh, in order to do economic theory, you can't have, you can't rely on a priori alleged a priori truths because these a priori truths are what they called analytic. They're just uh, definitions, they're part of definitions, they're just conventions that people have on how to use certain words. And Mises disagreed with that. He said, no, we can get a priori knowledge of what about the world. Uh, we can arrive at this through deduction from the concept of action. So Mises was disagreeing with them, but he agreed with them that we can't deduce particular events from just thinking about the world. We have to do empirical investigation to find out which particular events that had happened. But once we do the empirical investigation, we can use the praxeology to help us explain what happened. Uh, now, supposing, uh, it, which see, it seems pretty evident Mises is right, that uh, we can't do, uh, use praxeology to deduce particular events. Does it follow from that that there can't be historical laws, there can't be universal generalization? So I suppose we know, well, you can't get them from praxeology, but maybe you could get them from somewhere else. Uh, one possibility would be through inductive generalization, they would be uh, not something we claim to derive just by reason, we could say, claim by studying history, we could derive certain laws, certain generalizations. 
uh, for example, that one person who wrote along those lines was the uh, Russian sociologist who wound up as the first professor of sociology at Harvard, Peter M. Sorokin. He had a, I think, a three-volume book called Social and Cultural Dynamics, where he had various historical laws, and you find something like that, although in the works of Arnold Toynbee, a multi-volume study of history. But Mises didn't accept this. Uh, he said there, is, there are no constants in uh, human action. There aren't quantitative concepts. There's nothing like a historical law of gravitation that would enable us to calculate what people are doing. And he, he thought that uh, human free choice is an ultimate given, something that can't be explained further. So what the historian is doing, according to him, is to try to explain why people had made certain choices in history rather than try to come up with inductive generalizations, saying there are certain laws that determine what people uh, will choose. And when I say uh, human free choice, it's important to realize that Mises didn't mean anything very philosophically demanding by that. He wasn't talking about, say, what some people call indeterministic free will, or uh, he, 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 all he meant was that it's given to us that we have choices and we make them. He wasn't making any claims about uh, determinism in some sense, uh, given the existence of the particles composing people's bodies. Would it be possible to deduce uh, by physical law what would happen in future. He wasn't making any claims about that. All he was saying was, we're given in, by knowledge of action, that people make choices and we can't go beyond that uh, by appeal to inductive generalizations in history. So, uh, if there are no, uh, you can't deduce laws, uh, we can't deduce particular actions from praxeology, and there are also no universal inductive generalization about history, then we have the problem, can the historian explain events at all? What are, what are we, the historian supposed to do? And Mises said there is an escape from this, even though there aren't generalizations a historian can appeal to to explain particular events. The historian can grasp, can explain the event without making appeal to generalizations. We understand the event in its individuality, this particular event, rather than try to account for what the event has in common with other events. We're just grasping the event as an individual event. And he called this attempt to understand the individual event specific understanding. And he, he uh, sometimes uses the German term verstehen to mean this grasp of an individual, of individuality or an individual event. Sometimes he refers to it also as thymology, kind of a literary psychology. He liked, sometimes liked coining unusual words. It, even though English wasn't his native language, uh, Mises had a very uh, large vocabulary that he would sometimes uh, disp uh, display on unexpected occasions. Uh, so how does specific understanding work? Well, uh, we make judgments about the goals and beliefs of particular persons based on our own knowledge and experience. And so what we're, the historian is doing is try to account, say in understanding someone's action, try to account for the relevance of particular events 
in the actor's background. Uh, for example, uh, supposing a historian is trying to explain Abraham Lincoln's policy in uh, 1861, after he became president in March 1861, uh, he would use evidence about people, Lincoln's ends, for example, Lincoln's uh, desire to, res to end secession, to prevent the further sp uh, spread of slavery in the territories, and beliefs that Lincoln had. Uh, for example, he had military power to force the South to give up. And he would use uh, these beliefs and desires that he would attribute to Lincoln to try to explain what Lincoln did. He'd say, given that Lincoln had such and such beliefs or desires, suppose he thought that uh, by sending a... Uh, 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 rearming the Fort Sumter, he might be able to get the, uh, the southern forces to fire on the, on the ships uh, uh, trying to enter the, uh, reinforce the fort, and that way he could get a conflict started. That's one theory uh, held, say, by some historians such as Charles Ram, Ramsdale. Link, I mean, uh, Mises didn't commit himself to particular view of the Civil War origin, but that would be an example of what Mises has in mind. You would attribute certain uh, motives and beliefs to Lincoln, and then you try to explain what he did on that basis. So, see, he isn't appealing to general laws. He isn't saying whenever a president is, con is confronted by uh, states within his union or departments within his union trying to revolt, he'll do such and such. He's trying to understand the particular psychology of Abraham Lincoln in that way, try to explain uh, what he's doing. He's appealing to particular beliefs and desires he thinks that, uh, they certainly think that Lincoln has. Uh, now, one uh, mistake sometimes made is that in this process where you're trying to uh, figure out what the desires and beliefs of a historical actor have in order to explain what he did, uh, you, you talk about understanding, it doesn't imply that you're sympathizing with what the person is doing. You're seeing things from his point of view in the sense of trying to see how it would look to him. But it doesn't imply that you're, uh, agree you think the person acted rightly. Now, one, uh, one person who made this mistake is one of the greatest modern philosophers, uh, Saul Kripke, uh, some of you may know his great book, uh, Naming and Necessity, but Kripke uh, gave as an example a uh, very controversial historian, David Irving, who wrote a book called Hitler's War. And uh, what Kripke said, he was writing an account of uh, R.G. Collingwood's philosophy of history, as I'll explain a little later, Collingwood had some influence on Mises' account, had a similar way of understanding history. So Kripke said, well, look, uh, uh, Irving has tried to explain things from Hitler's point of view, and he's become very sympathetic to Hitler. So you know, this is a big danger of of doing history in, in this way of trying to understand the what the actors' motives and desires are. But it doesn't at all mean that it, the historian who's doing this isn't at all committed to sympathizing with the uh, value with the values or belief or and beliefs of the of the act. He's just trying to explain them. And when you're studying the value judgment of other, you're making a descriptive statement. You're not making an evaluation yourself. You're just saying, this person held such and such value. So in Mises' view, 
history can be written in a value-free way. Uh, now, another mistake is somewhat related to the uh, one I just made, although it's not a logical consequence of that mistake, is that it doesn't, in this method of specific understanding, doesn't ex uh, require taking what the historical subject says at face value. It, if, when you're trying to ex say you're trying to explain the actor's uh, behavior through his beliefs, values, desires, and so on, it doesn't imply you're accepting whatever he says. You can certainly think he has a wrong account of what he was trying to do, but you're just trying to figure out, again, through specific understanding what he's doing. Uh, in a very interesting paper, I don't think it's gotten the attention it deserves, called The Treatment of Irrationality in the Social Sciences. Uh, Mises criticized the great medievalist Ernst Kantorowicz, who, uh, who was from uh, a German historian. He, he wrote a famous biography of Frederick II that had, it was a bestseller in Germany in the early 1930s. Hitler was a great admirer of the book. But uh, Kantorowicz had to go into exile because he was Jewish, and he wound up at Berkeley. And he wrote a very famous book, uh, probably a lot of you have read this or have heard of it, it's called The King's Two Bodies. So what Mises said, he criticized Kantorowicz, he says Kantorowicz was taking the symbolism used in some of the documents in the Holy Roman Empire too seriously accepted them at face value, and he didn't consider the real power relations uh, where the, uh, the states and princes within the Holy Roman Empire had much more power than the emperor, and he thought that Kantorowicz had given too much weight to the emperor. So you see, uh, Specific understanding, as I say, doesn't imply taking at face value what the, uh, the historical actors have said. Uh, now, uh, Mises, as I mentioned his name already, was influenced a lot by the British uh, historian and philosopher, also archaeologist. He was a, uh, he was a great authority on... Uh, Roman Britain, Britain at the time of when the Romans had conquered Britain. Uh, R.G. Collingwood, who lived from 1889 to 1943. And uh, probably Collingwood's most important book on uh, historical method was called uh, The Idea of History. It was published after his death in 1946 by his literary executor, uh, T.M. Knox, who was also wrote uh, later is under the name Sir Malcolm Knox, who was a Scottish uh, uh, writer. So what Collingwood said, and you'll see the similarity to Mises, he said the historian should try to recreate or recollect the thoughts of the person he studied. So say if you were trying to explain why uh, Caesar had crossed the Rubicon River in 49 BC, you'd be trying to reconstruct Caesar's thoughts. And the unusual part of Collingwood's uh, theory, he thought that if the historian succeeded in this, his thought would be identical to that of the historical actor, so that if you were had come up with the correct account of why Caesar crossed the Rubicon, you would be rethinking Caesar's thought. And this is in a very strong sense, not just that you would be having the same qualitative, the same ideas as the one Caesar had, but you would be having exactly numerically the same thought as Caesar. 
This, as you will see, is, as you can see, is a quite unusual view, but Mises didn't accept this. And there were other people who wrote in this tradition of Verstehen, specific understanding, including the uh, philosophers Wilhelm Windelbahn, uh, Wilhelm Diltai, Heinrich Rickert, and the Italian Benedetto Croce. Uh, now, as I mentioned the, uh, before, the pos logical positivists were the great opponents of Mises in methodology. So here, too, in historical uh, understanding, uh, they opposed what Mises said. And the philosophers who were sympathetic to positivism, such as Ernest Nagel, who was uh, taught at Columbia University for a long time. Uh, Nagel was one of Murray Rothbard's teachers. Uh, uh, Murray liked him very much. He said he was very friendly to students. So what he, what Nagel said, well, uh, for Stein, or specific understanding, might very well be a good way to generate a hypothesis, say you might, by trying to think yourself into Lincoln's uh, uh, mind in March 1861. You might come up with a good hypothesis about how Lincoln uh, what Lincoln did at the onset of the Civil War, but it couldn't give you knowledge. All you could do would be uh, come up with a particular account that might appeal to your imagination, but that isn't knowledge, that's just speculation. And what Mises' reply here was really that the only way to judge uh, uh, case of specific understanding was how convincing you found it. If, say, you found this a convincing account, that was all you could do. There wasn't any further thing you could appeal to. I mean, of course, you could see if, say, if you came up with later documents, you could see how, uh, whether you could use your explanation to explain those. But there wasn't, there isn't anything in history like the scientific verification of a, of a hypothesis that can be appealed to. Uh, so what the positivist said, well, instead of using Verstehen, what you should try to do is come up with laws of history. And uh, so uh, you, uh, in the, uh, similar to scientific laws, laws of physics, you'd have laws of history, even though they might not be able to be formulate, formulated in as exact a form as you get in the physical sciences. The most important defense of this view is in uh, an article that came out in 1942 by the uh, member of the Vienna Circle who taught at Princeton for a long time, Carl Hempel, and the article is called The Function of General Laws in History. So Hempel said, well, OK, we can't get exact laws. We might sometimes be satisfied with what he called explanation sketches. But this is what we should try, what we should be aiming for. So this uh, uh, approach is usually called following a writer called W.H. Dre, William Dre, who was a critic of the pause was called the covering law model because it's trying to come up with a law that will explain, uh, come up with a law that covers or explains particular event. Uh, and Mises' reply to this is very simple, that there aren't any such laws. There aren't laws, say there aren't laws, say we're trying to explain, use the example I gave before, why Caesar crossed the Rubicon. There aren't laws that say, uh, uh, ambitious uh, generals faced with an order that they think detracts from their honor will, under such and such conditions, disobey the order. All that we have are uh, a particular event that Caesar crossed the river, and the historian can try to explain that. Uh, so I think uh, I was going to say a little bit about ideal types, but 
uh, we're running out of time, so I'll just say one thing at the end about this other uh, philosophies of history in the sense of trying to come up with a general explanation of the whole of history. And uh, let me just skip to that so we can forget about, oh, we can forget about ideal type. You remember that a basic principle of praxeology is that only individuals act. And a lot of the philosophies of history that doctrines say there's a meaning to the whole history violate this process. So examples would be Hegel thought there was something called geist or spirit that was coming to consciousness in history, or Marx thought there were the forces of production were tending to grow automatically develop throughout history and various systems of production would come into being and be replaced depending on how well they developed the force of production. And Oswald Spengler thought that cultures were really organisms that had laws of growth and decay. So all of these violated methodological individualism and Mises rejected them. So I think uh, having rejected philosophy of history in this sense would be a good time to finish. So thanks very much. <laughs>